Okay? So, all right. Um, so let's see how much I want to say about this. Okay, well, there's, there's other methods called uh, multi-step methods. So if you look at a method like this, this says, you give me the value at yn, and I'll give you the value back at yn plus 1. Okay? This is called a single step method. In other words, it uses the value immediately before to get the next value. It doesn't need yn minus 1 or yn minus 2 or anything like that. Okay? So that's called a single step method. A multi-step method uses more than one value, previous value, to find the current value. So for example, you might have a method that computes yn plus 1. It needs knowledge of yn and yn minus 1, which was the iteration before the last iteration. Okay? Those are called multi-step methods. And this is the general development. I, I used to do more of this, and I'll explain why. I'm going to have to explain it a little more quickly than I used to in the past. So you have this equation here, right? This is your differential equation. This is the, val this is the thing you want to solve. That means you want to integrate this equation, right? That's what it means to solve a differential equation is integrate it. If, um, the, if it's a nice differential equation, you can solve it analytically by integrating it, but usually you can't. But you could do this. You can separate this equation, right? Separate and integrate, right? You've done this before. So what I'm doing here is I'm separating this equation, putting dy over here, and then putting f of x dx over here. And then I'm integrating this between xn and xn plus 1, okay? where again, xn and xn plus 1 would be two of these values separated by a distance h. Okay? The good news is that you can obviously integrate the right-hand side, because that's how the, I mean, the left-hand side, that just gives you that there. Right? I mean, the integral of dy is y. <laughs> and then you have to evaluate y at the two limits. That's those, that's those two values right there. Okay? The problem is you can't integrate the right-hand side. If you, if you could integrate the right-hand side, you wouldn't do numerics. You would just integrate it and get the answer. Okay? So what are you going to do if you can't integrate the right-hand side of the equation? Whoops. Well, substitute in something that approximates this function that you can integrate. Right? And um, perhaps the easiest thing in the world to integrate is a polynomial. Right? So if, I, if this function f was a polynomial, you could integrate it. Everyone knows how to integrate or differentiate a polynomial. right? So if you do that, you get an equation that looks like this, where this p of x here is going to be a polynomial approximation of that function f. Right? And if I gave you a cubic, you could integrate that, and then, then you could get an answer. Right? So the question is, how do you come up with that p, <laughs> right? the polynomial that approximates the function? Okay? Depending on which, how you construct this polynomial, you get a different method. Okay? So there's ways to approximate a function with a polynomial. It's, you do something, you construct something called an interpolation polynomial. I'll just give you the basic idea, but I won't be able to go through the details. So if you had a function, let's say, that looked like this, okay? And then let's just say you take an arbitrary function and you wanted to construct a polynomial that went through those four points. You can guarantee there's a cubic polynomial that goes through all those three points. Something called the Weierstrass theorem. It's one of the most uh, famous uh, theorems in, in uh, real analysis. So it says, if you want to interpolate, right, if you want to interpolate two points, a line is enough. You agree? A line goes through two points. If you want to have a function that goes through three points, you need a quadratic. If you want a function that goes through three points, you need a, or four points, you need a cubic. And this goes on ad infinitum. You can interpolate 100 points with a polynomial that's 99th order. It's guaranteed. Okay? So there's ways to construct these polynomials. Okay? So what you do, which I'll show you on the next page, is you construct it from, you, you evaluate this function at some points, like for example, four points or three points. You construct a polynomial that interpolates those, then you integrate the polynomial, and then you get a method. Okay? So for example, there's something called Adams-Bashworth method. The Adams-Bashworth method is based on constructing a polynomial that interpolates these three points. In other words, it's a polynomial that goes through the points xn, yn, yn minus xn minus 1, yn minus 1, also n minus 2 and n minus 3. So these are the, right, these are the four previous solutions, right? The last one you got, the one before that, the one before, one before that. You fit a, you fit a cubic, 
that goes through those four points, then you integrate that, and, once you, and then you evaluate the limits, and once you're all done, you'll get something that looks like this. Obviously, the, de the, the devil's in the details, as they say. All right, so, just, so this is the definition of what I mean, Fn. Fn is shorthand notation. It means just evaluate the function at xn and yn. Same thing for n minus 1, xn minus 1, yn minus 1. You get something that looks like this, okay? Now, why do you call this a multi-step method? Because you can see to get the value at yn plus 1, I'm using values at yn, n minus 1, n minus 2, and n minus 3. It uses more than just the pass value, which is yn. It uses four pass values. Okay? All right. Um, it's an explicit method because we know all this stuff, right? Because we already have done the previous iterations to generate all these. So it's, it's easy enough to evaluate this. It requires four function evaluations, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and these coefficients you get by per actually performing the integration. All right, and it's a relatively high order method. The Euler method, right, is order h. The, the Runge-Kutta method I showed you before is actually order h to the fourth as well. Okay, so that's an alternative. Um, you can see one of the problems you're going to have is getting this iteration started, right? Because if you want to generate y1, you need y0, that's okay because that's the initial condition, y0. But you also need y minus 1, y minus 2, and y minus 3, right? And you don't have those. So usually to get this iterative calculation started, you have to use a single step method to generate the first three steps, and then you can switch to this method, right? So for example, you could use this runga kutta thing to get y1, y2, and y3, and then you can launch off with this because you don't have a y minus 1 or y minus 2 to get started. All right? All right. Um, I think I'll skip this. This is the, this another method. It, just, it, it does a different interpolation. So by interpolating those four points, you get an explicit method. If you interpolate the four points shown at the top, including the xn, yn, xn plus 1, yn plus 1, then you'll get a s somewhat similar equation, except now you'll have an implicit method because to compute yn plus 1 requires you evaluate that function. That function depends on yn plus 1. So it appears there, it appears there. So again, not implicit method, you have to do um, kind of an iterative scheme. Okay? All right. So that's what it means when they say multi-step versus single step. Here's the last thing. I'm not going to go through the details here, which I added this year. But, um, so let's say you had a problem that looked like this. So let's just say conceptually, here's y and here's x. And you, you get a solution that, let's say, the solution looks like this. That's like, that's like an exponential looking solution, right? So what you notice about this solution is it changes very rapidly initially, and then it changes very slowly later until finally it reaches some maybe steady state or something out here. Stops changing, OK? All right. So with this whole, I'm not going to go through the details here, but the whole idea here is that if the solution is changing rapidly, you need a small step size, right? So I'm sorry to do this to you, but I can't help myself. You might recall when we interpreted the Euler method as finding the slope here, you can see if this, if this true solution is changing very rapidly, in order to get a good approximation of the slope, you'll want a very small h, okay? So the idea is that you would like to use or you actually need to use to get an accurate solution, a very small value of h here because the solution is changing very quickly. But over here, you don't, need a small, you don't need a small value of h. You can use a large value of h because the solution is changing very slowly. See, so you're in a bit of a quandary there because if you use a small step size here, you'll resolve this solution really well. It'll be very accurate, but it'll take a long time over here when it shouldn't, you don't really need it to. It'll be too slow, in other words. If you use too large a step size, it'll be fast, but the solution will be very inaccurate there. So that's not good, right? So most modern codes, in fact, all codes that are worth anything, use something called a variable step size. It, it, the code automatically adjusts the h for you. Where's the h? This thing. Automatically adjusts it for you, OK? It does this by using very, I can't draw step, but it'll use very small step sizes here. And then when the solution starts, 
changing that much, it'll take much bigger step sizes. This gives you a nice compromise between accurate solution when you need it, when it's changing rapidly, and then fast when it's not changing rapidly. Something wrong? Everyone looks perplexed, okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, I'm used to perplexion. I saw something more than perplexion, okay. Um, so this is called a variable step size. And so all the codes in MATLAB use this. So when you use MATLAB codes, you never specify a step size ever, okay? Because there's no reason for you to specify a step size. MATLAB will automatically control the step size for you. And this mathematics here, which I won't go over, is shows you how the step size is controlled. Basically does this control the air. So the way you use a code is you specify how much air is acceptable, and then it figures out the step size that'll make sure your air is that small or smaller, okay? These are things in MATLAB that you'll probably never change because they have default values. They're called absolute tolerance and relevant, relative tolerance. They're usually, I think, something on the order of 10 to the minus 6th. In other words, MATLAB uses these as defaults. You never tend to change them. If you wanted to change them, you would do it in this thing called OD set, which I explained to you when I, okay. So you specify what errors, these are so-called tolerances, how much error you'll allow in the solution and then it'll adjust the step size automatically. So no need for you to do so. No need for you to pick a step size, which is good, right? Because you don't know what a good step size is. And in fact, when we tried to figure out what a good step size was for the Euler method, we came up with this, this situation, right? That if we picked it small enough, it worked. And if we picked it too big, it oscillated. If we took it way too big, it was unstable, the solution. Not the real system, the solution. And we had no idea where to pick it we didn't know what H would work, okay? So you don't really have to worry about this, which is nice. Okay. So that's the end of that. Now I want to talk about this. So, so far everything we've talked about is based on there being a single equation, single differential equation. Uh, no problems of real practical interest involve a single differential equation. They involve system of differential equations. So the MATLAB homework I gave you, for the bioreactor problem, probably had three differential equations, I think. And I think the, the, if you're doing the project differential equation, that's also three differential equations, as I recall. Okay. So the point of this method is to talk about how you can extend these methods to more than one differential equation, basically. Okay. And the key thing is really this idea of stiffness, which this only occurs if you have more than one differential equation. Okay. So I want to explain that and then try to give you some motivation for why you want to use these implicit methods, right? Because so far, this seems like kind of a waste of time. But if the problem is stiff, you'll see it's quite important. OK. Um, so here's the, here's the um, obligatory explanation of why we care about this. Most problems of interest are going to be a couple different nonlinear differential equations, not single one. The only, gonna, the only option is to solve them numerically. So if you have sets of differential equations that look like this, so in this case I'm saying there's m of them, m equations, okay? We want to integrate these things. They're all coupled together, so we have to integrate them simultaneously. Each equation has an initial condition that looks like that. Then guess what? We're going, to we're going to find a vector of y's and a vector function f and write it in that form. It's nothing new, right? Just a set of differential equations instead of a single differential equation. Y is a column vector with the Y stacked on each other, uh, each other. F is a vector function. That's the first element. F2 is the second element, so on and so forth. That's a vector of initial conditions, looks those values. OK? All right. And then I showed you in the past that um, if you had a system that looked like this, sometimes some of our problems look like this. You don't know why yet. <laughs> But if you have a diffusion problem or a heat conduction problem, you're going to get a second order derivative like this appearing in the equations. Because you have like Fickian diffusion or Laplace's law of heat conduction. Okay? And these are things you'll learn when you take heat and mass transfer. And those will yield second order differential equations. So if you look at this, it does not look like that, right? So I, I already taught you that if you want to convert an equation that looks like this, this is a single second order differential equation in y, okay, for y, then you can do the following. I, I, go back in the notes if you don't remember, but you can define a system of equations where you define a variable y1 to be equal to y, and you define a variable y2 to be the derivative of y. Okay. 
And then you can write two differential equations, one for y1 and one for y2. So in other words, you can take that second order differential equation and convert it to two first order differential equations and do everything I'm talking about. That's z. Yeah. I love t. Got to be flexible here. OK. So there's no loss in generality. If you wanted to apply it to a system like a heat conduction or a diffusion problem you would get, you can do that. OK. So this is really, you should never preface material like this. This is really boring. OK, so we're going to do this quickly. It's just like, if you can do something once, you can do it twice or 20 times, right? So here is how you do the Euler method, OK? So, right, how do you use the Euler method? You want to find n plus 1 using the value at n. Now you have more than one y. So we have two subscripts. The first one is which variable you're talking about. The second subscript is which iteration you're talking about. Okay? So this says if you want to have an iterative equation like this Euler method, then you have to do the following. You have to, first of all, evaluate the function, right? This is the first function. This is the function associated with the differential equation for y1. Evaluate that at the point n. That means you might have to evaluate y1 there and y2 there. All the y's are evaluated at iteration n, OK? Evaluate the function there, multiply by h, multiply by the value of y at n, and get the new value at n plus 1. So it's the same as before, except the right-hand side now depends on other y's. You just evaluate those y's at n as well. Okay? You do that for every equation, okay? including the last equation, where this is the iterative Euler equation to generate m uh, for the variable m, y m, and the, get to get the value at n plus 1 from the value at n. So it's, just, it's the same thing except scaled to more, ver more equations. It's like the difference between solving a single nonlinear algebraic equation and two, okay, or ten, whatever. Okay. So it generally looks like this if you want to write it in vector form. You take that whole vector function, you evaluate it xn, and you use all the values of yn that you have, right, because you just did the iteration before. You, you get the whole, right, vector function f. You add that on to y, which is a vector, at iteration n, and you generate the vector of y at n plus one, and you just keep going around. Okay. So there's, it's, once you know how to do the Euler for one equation, it's not very hard to know how to do the Euler for as many equations as you want. Okay? I'm not going to belabor this, but you can do the same thing for the Runge cut or any of the methods I just explained to you. They all become vector calculations instead of scalar calculations. That's it. Okay? So just to put a little meat on this, here's a little example. Um, again, it comes from kinetics, so don't worry so much about how the model is obtained or what it means is how you apply the method. So this is a reaction scheme. I guess it's famous enough to be named after someone. Okay. So you have a reactant A forms B, and then in a, 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 another reaction forms a reaction C. Those are the rates, R1 and R2. And then you also have some side reaction where 2A goes to something like D. Okay. So I think the classic problem here is you want to produce you want to produce B, right? So you want A to produce B, but B, unfortunately, further reacts to C. That's bad, and there's also a side reaction that takes A to D, and that's bad, okay? So these are the rates of the reactions per unit volume. Again, I know you guys haven't had kinetics, so it's not essential that you understand the details of this, because I'm not going to put something like this on a test or expect that you know it. But it's not unreasonable. I hope that you can see if you had a reaction where A was the reactant, the, the rate of the reaction would probably depend on the concentration of A. The more A you have, the faster the rate, right? And then there's some rate constant. The reason this thing is squared is because you have 2A, okay? So I won't belabor that any further. If you write out the equations for this in a continuous flow stirred tank reactor, which you don't need to know, you get these equations here, okay? You get one equation for the concentration of A and one for the uh, concentration of B. And um, just for your edification, that's the volumetric flow in and out of the reactor. That's the volume of the reactor. That's the inlet concentration of A. And the, that's it. And the other things are rate constants, as I showed you or talked to you about. OK. So if you write this out in the form we like, you have this equation. It depends on A and B, right? Actually, it doesn't depend on B. <laughs> But I wrote it as if it did anyway, right? This depends just on A. But generally speaking, I wrote it on all the variables. And this is some other function that depends on A and B. So if you want to apply the Euler method, 
let's say, to this equation right here, it looks like this, right? So you get two equations, one for A, one for B. So if you want to know what the concentration of A is at iteration n plus 1, you find the value at n, which you already have. You multiply it by h times this function f1, that's this thing right here, evaluated at um, a n and b n, which doesn't really depend on b n. And if, so if you evaluate the right hand side here at a n, you get this equation here. And so this is not, there's a lot of equation there and almost nothing in, uh, exciting or challenging. Okay? So I just took the value at n plus, uh, sorry, the value at n, took the step size h and multiplied this whole function and everywhere I have a, I put a comma n and got that. Okay? And then you do the same thing for the second equation. To do that, you need to know the value at a and b at n. So you take the value of b, step size times this function evaluated at n, and you get that. Okay? So this is two iterative equations. To get it started, you start off with knowledge of, whoops, what A is the initial condition. Okay, this is the initial condition here. You plug the initial condition in there for A and the initial condition in here for A and B. And then you'll get CA comma 1 and CB comma 1. And then you plug it back into this equation, right? CA1 and CB1. And then you'll get CA comma 2 and CB comma 2. And you just keep going, okay? So I did it, of course. I couldn't help myself. Um, so these are some parameter values that don't really matter, but concentration of A is 10, volumetric flow rate 5, volume of the reactor 1. You see the three rate constants there, and I took a, I took a step size of a small one that I thought would work well. Okay? And this just shows the results of the internet calculation. I just do this actually at the command line of MATLAB, right? Because if you, if you have equations written out like this in MATLAB, you can just do this all at the command line. Right? Because you just take the value generate before and just do it again. So it's, I don't even write a function, even though you could. And you get something that looks like this. So the iteration number n is shown there. Um, and you got to remember n is a pretty small number, right? So like for example, 5n means 0 0.05 is the time. So you see the first few iterations, and then I obviously got tired of listing them, so I just showed you what it was if you really went for a long time. I guess I hit, I hit return, I went up arrow return 80 times. <laughs> I need to work on, obviously, my um, hobbies and stuff. But um, all right, so this is what it looks like. You start off with A at 10 and B at 0. And then you see over a period of time, A is consumed, which is what you'd expect because it's the reactant, and B starts being produced until finally you reach some steady, kind of steady state there. And, here, and then I plotted the solution. It looks nice and smooth because I generated 80 different val 80 values, right? And so that's enough to give you a nice smooth curve. So I just plotted, I created a big vector of N and CA and CB. They all had 80 elements, and I plotted, and I got these. So there's the concentration of A going to there, and there's the concentration of B going there, okay? All right, so it's, it's, it's easy to do, let's just say that. All right, now, so what's the challenge here? Because the way I've explained it so far is there's nothing interesting or challenging about this, okay. Um, and that's kind of true. Obviously, computational increase because, you know, if you have one equation versus 100 equations, it'll take longer to do this with 100 equations. But uh, the kind of technical challenge here is if you have a certain kind of system called STIFF, okay? All right, so if you have, let's say, a linear set of linear differential equations, just for the sake of illustration, you have an equation that looks like this. Right, we talked about how to solve this equation, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So the key here is you find the eigenvalues of the matrix A, right? And if you do this, you'll find, I don't know, how many there are, right? If A is an n by n matrix, you'll find n eigenvalues, okay? Now, if these eigenvalues, so, and I taught you this too, I'm pretty sure. In fact, I know I did. You can take these eigenvalues, and in general, these are going to be complex numbers, right? 
they're going to have a real part and an imaginary part. They might be just real or they might be just imaginary, but in general, they're complex. And you can plot them in this plane, like this is the real part of the eigenvalue and this is the imaginary part. So if it's something just real, it lies on this axis, and if it's just imaginary, it lies on this axis, otherwise it's in one of the quadrants, right? And you remember I drew this picture and I told you systems that have eigenvalues over here are stable and ones over here are unstable. Okay. So what does a stiff system mean? So a stiff system might mean you have one eigenvalue there and then you have one eigenvalue there. Like they're really far apart from each other. This one might be minus one and this one might be like minus 100. Okay? So you remember that if you look at the solution, you might recall that the solution for this looks like this. We don't care what the constants are and we don't even care what the eigenvectors are. But they depend on the eigenvalues like that, right? Okay. So if you have something that has e to the minus 100t, this decays really quickly to zero, right? Because that's really high value, minus 100t. And then you have another term that's like e to the minus t. This will decay much more slowly. Okay. So, th so you see what happens here is to, to, re to resolve this term, you need a really small step size because it changes really quickly. And this one you need to integrate for a long time because it changes really slowly. So these kind of problems tend to be challenging, okay? Because you both have terms in the solution that change really quickly that you need a really small step size and then you have other terms that change really slowly which means you've got to integrate for a long time to, to resolve their effects, right? If you want to see this term go to zero, you have to wait a lot longer than that term going to zero. So if you have a system like this, it's called stiff, okay? Where the eigenvalues are different by like an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude, okay? So that's if the system is linear. If the system is not linear, it can also have this. This is what's called, usually called uh, multi-time scale behavior or separation of time scales. <coughs> things that happen very quickly combined with things that happen much more slowly. Very common in chemical engineering, actually. Um, you can also have this in nonlinear systems, but obviously you can't, you don't really use the concept of eigenvalues here because, you know, nonlinear systems don't have eigenvalues. And so a system, that nonlinear system that exhibits a, this kind of behavior might look something like this. So you have two sets of variables, y's and z's. So this is two sets of differential equations. Each is a set, okay? And these variables here are relatively um, slow, and these r values here are relatively fast. How do I know that? Because this epsilon is a really small number, like 0.1 or less, okay? So these z variables quit changing very quickly. They correspond to eigenvalues that are like way out here. And then these other variables change very slowly. Okay. Um, and so if you have a problem that's like this, then, then this is much more difficult to solve and straightforward applications are the things I told you don't work well. You, you, you might recall when I did the MATLAB exercise, I went through the different, remember we did that Vanderpool thing and I showed you that um, we did two examples, Vanderpool where the constant mu was I think one and one where it was 1,000 and I showed you if the problem was stiff, that was mu 1000, and used a stiff solver, specially designed, it worked really well, but if you didn't, you didn't get an answer at all. Like you hit return and we just wait, remember I hit control C to stop because I didn't want to wait. Because it takes hours if you ever get an answer. So you have to take, if you have sets of differential equations, you have to make special consideration, they might be stiff and you need special solvers to deal with it. Okay. If you don't use special solvers, you get what I showed you up here. You, it doesn't give you an answer in any reasonable amount of time. Okay. And for these kind of um, equations that are stiff, you really want to use methods like this that are implicit. These explicit methods don't work at all well on problems that are stiff. You really want to use implicit methods. Okay. Um, and so they offer, so just so you know what I mean, so everyone knows what, I guess you know what speed means. That means like I hit the button, how quickly do I get an answer? Computational speed. Stability means, is the solution of the equation um, stable? It doesn't mean the actual system is stable. It means, is my numerical solution stable? So, oh, sorry. So you might recall when we did the other example way back here, this was not, this is only a single equation, but here's an example where the numerical method was unstable. Not the system, not the real system, but my, my attempt to solve it, right? 
So if you have sets of equations, more than one that are stiff, and you use an explicit method, it's very likely that something like this will happen, or much more likely than if you use an implicit method. Okay? Okay, so, so what I'm telling you, and I'm not giving you a lot of proof of this, if the, if the system is stiff, you want to use an implicit method. Okay, so the next question is, well, how do I know if the system is stiff? <laughs> and the answer is, you usually don't know if it's stiff, okay? Um, my experience is that once you get to a system of reasonable complexity, like if you have one equation, it probably won't be stiff. Two or three. But once you get to a complex system, it, it's almost always stiff. Okay. So here, here's the upshot. If the problem is not stiff and use a stiff solver, you'll waste some time. Like it might take three times longer than it should. But if the problem is stiff and you don't use a stiff solver, you'll never get an answer. Right? So it's always better to err on the assumption the problem is stiff until proven otherwise. Right? And the other thing you can do in MATLAB is you can just try the different solvers. I showed you how to do it. You just try each of them. You can just, you know, you have OD15 or 45. You run it. Then you just change the 45 to 15S to switch to a stiff solver, rerun it again, see which one's faster. But the, the main point here is you have to customize the solution method to the problem you're working on. Not, not one method works best for all problems. And that's a general theme of all numerical methods is that once the problem becomes non-trivial, nobody can write one method that works well for all problems. Okay? So if the problem is stiff, you need a stiff solver. If the problem is not stiff, you can use a stiff solver, but you'll kind of be wasting time. But we do this a lot in my research group, and we just always use stiff solvers, just because the problems we work on are large, and usually they're, they're stiff. Okay? And so this is just the vectorized version of the um, Euler method, right? This is the implicit method. We call this the uh, backward difference. Right? And the key here is you evaluate the function, in this case, vector function, because you have more than one equation at the point n plus 1. So right, it looks like this. It's just a vectorized version of this equation right here. And of course, the disadvantage of this is you have to solve this nonlinear algebraic equation to find yn plus 1. And so if you're doing it this way, you have to solve a set of nonlinear algebraic equations every iteration. But it ends up working, you see. You'd rather have high computation where you get an answer and it's stable than quick computation where you fail. So the, this is more uh, complicated. It requires more computational overhead, but um, it's worth the effort. Okay? And the idea is Mat MATLAB will, does all this stuff for you, you see. All you have to do is pick which solver you want, and it takes care of all the calculations. So the easiest thing to do if you use MATLAB is simply pick different solvers and see which one works best for your problem. If you have the problems like you're doing on your project, they'll all work well. And they'll all be fast because the project's so simple. No offense. It's just three equations. But if you start getting, like if you want to do a simulation of a distillation column, you might, if you built a, um, a rigorous model of a distillation column, which you might not do in MATLAB, but if you did, that might be 300 differential equations coupled together. And then which method you use would be very important. Okay? All right, so what do I want to do with this? Trying to figure out where I want to stop here. I'll just keep going until I run out of time. We, got, we have the evaluation, so I want to leave you like 10 minutes, and I want to comment a few things like I'm looking for. I'm looking for insults, actually, because those are a lot of fun. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I always say when you do the evaluation, you can say anything you want about me, but just leave my family out of it, okay? <laughs> All right. All right, so let, let's, um, let's, let's do this little toy problem. I don't, I don't think I'll probably uh, complete it.